Well, good Sunday morning, beloved ones, and thank you for tuning in today. I do appreciate it. So you might have had this experience where you sit down to pray for someone, something, uh, some circumstance, some situation, and you realize, I have no idea what to pray for here. I don't know the end from the middle, from the beginning. God, I don't know what to ask for. I don't know how to pray in this situation and in this circumstance. Well, we get great encouragement over in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, and I hope this will be an encouragement to you today. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that when we have no idea what to pray for, we're confused, we don't know the end from the middle, from the beginning, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. What great assurance this is. What blessing you have provided for us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray today that as we gather together and sit before your word, you would, by your Spirit, Teach us. Give us wisdom and insight into the Scripture and how it is applied into our everyday lives. And then by your Spirit, empower us to live it out for your glory. And Father, we do ask this all today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Christina. And if you have your Bibles today, let me invite you to turn on over to 2 Peter chapter 3, the final chapter of this letter. Now, you may have heard me use a phrase from time to time, and it is the phrase, living, looking up. Living, looking up. And by that, I mean how we as believers walk this journey of faith. We, we travel this pilgrim's pathway, as it were, in eager anticipation of Christ's imminent return, eagerly awaiting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And I get that phrase, living looking up, out of Philippians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul there says, our citizenship is in heaven. By the way, you ever wonder where your home is? Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await, there it is, eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when He returns, He will transform these lowly bodies into conformity with His glorious body by the exertion of His power. We live in eager anticipation of that day and how we do look forward to it. I mean, we get to see Jesus face to face. We get to see our loved ones in Christ bodily raised up from the grave and gloriously transformed to be like Jesus. And of course, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, we who are alive and remain will also be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall be with Him forever. And encourage one another with these words and how we absolutely do. So living, looking up in eager anticipation of Christ's imminent return. Now as we turn to our text today, 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to see Peter dealing with a group of folks. He's going to call them mockers. I think the false teachers are still in view here. But he's going to call them scoffers, mockers. And they are denying the return of Jesus. And you say, well, that's going to be a great day. Why would they deny the return of Jesus? Well, we're going to find out why and some other things along the way. So let's read our text. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice, that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Well, I've outlined the passage out this way, verses 1 and 2. We're going to see the Scripture's safeguard. Then verses 3 through 7, we're going to see the scoffer's ridicule. And then in verses 8 through 9, I came up with this little rhyme, the promise is not delayed, the Lord's patience is displayed. So let's just jump right in here with verses 1 and 2, the Scripture's safeguard. So Peter says here in verse 1, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. Okay, so quiz time. What was the first letter he wrote to them? Well, easy quiz, right? First Peter, where he wrote to them uh, about the suffering and trials and persecution that they're facing. Of course, this is the second letter. And he's writing to them dealing with these false teachers and false teaching And notice Peter's description of these believers. He calls them what? His beloved. His beloved ones. We're going to see the same term in verse 8, verse 14, verse 17, all throughout this chapter, beloved ones, beloved ones, beloved ones. And I think this reflects Peter's shepherding heart for these believers. Uh, And it stands in stark contrast to chapter 2. And the false teachers of chapter 2, who you will remember... They looked at the flock, and what did they see? Prey, eyes full of adultery, hearts trained in greed. Peter looks at the flock, what does he see? His beloved ones. What a contrast between the shepherd and the wolves we have here. And even more of a contrast, what is Peter's desire here for the congregation in verses 1 and 2? I mean, we know what the false teachers desired of the congregation. What does Peter desire of the congregation? He says, I am stirring up your sincere mind. 
Now, we had a whole sermon on this terminology back in chapter 1, but the idea here of stirring up your sincere mind is activating the mind, uh, engaging the mind by way of reminder. In other words, Peter wants their minds actively engaged, thinking deeply on what? Verse 2, that you should remember, right? Minds actively engaged, thinking deeply on what? The words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets, the, the prophecies foretold by the holy prophets. Now, of course, where are they going to find this prophetic word? It's in the pages of Scripture. What we would call the Old Testament, but in the pages of Scripture. So he's driving them to the word and to the prophetic word of God. And then secondly, and as of equal authority, he says, I want you to remember the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Of course, Peter was one of those apostles. But you might remember uh, over in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus, after his resurrection, he commissions the disciples as apostles uh, to go out as his eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And under his authority, they are sent out. And you'll remember there, part of the mission for these apostles is to go out teaching them. In other words, everywhere you go, the people to whom you go, teach them, Jesus says, to observe everything I have commanded you. So the apostles, they weren't out there making this stuff up as they went along. No, they were teaching what was commanded to them by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, that teaching was authoritative. It's recorded in New Testament Scripture, like this very letter that these believers would be receiving. So in the big picture, Peter wants their minds actively engaged in God's Word. And in particular, he wants their minds engaged in what was foretold by the prophets and what was taught by the apostles. Now, this is of great relevance Here in our context, it's going to be essential because what we're going to see is that these believers are dealing with scoffers who are denying a fundamental aspect of what the prophets foretold and what the apostles taught. They were denying the return of Jesus and the coming day of the Lord that would usher in upon the ungodly. Well, Peter wants his beloved flock to know, look, all of this has already been foretold. Just go back to God's word. Go back to the prophetic word. Go back to the prophets. Pay attention to what the apostles taught. Get your minds engaged in God's word and stay there. That's your safeguard against the lies and deception. And by the way, just a quick application for us today. Believer, get in the word. Get your mind engaged in the word and stay there. That's always going to be your safeguard against the lies and deception of the enemy. Now, whether those lies and deception have to do with the return of Jesus or some other lie and deception that's out there, our safeguard is the Word of God. It's our safeguard against the lies and deception of the enemy. And I say enemy singular because the people we come across in this world who are scoffers and mockers and deniers and ridiculers of biblical truth, they are not the enemy. Standing behind them is the enemy, the father of lies, Satan, the adversary. But they're not the enemy. But Peter knows here that the safeguard for the flock as they have to deal with these scoffers is get in the word, stay in the word. That's my encouragement to you, beloved ones. Get in the word and stay in the word. And specifically here, remember what the apostles taught and what the prophets foretold. So, verses 1 and 2, the scriptures are the safeguard. Now, verses 3 through 7. I'll put this under the scoffers' ridicule. And what are they ridiculing? Well, the return of Jesus. So Peter says in verse 3, know this. Like, Like, just take this as a fact. Know this. In the last days. Now, let's just pause right there. So Peter's audience, they were living in the last days. You know what? So too are we. We are living in the last days, which is to say we are living in this time period, this time frame, when Jesus' promised return is imminent, and from our perspective, it could be at any moment. 
We're living in the last days. And Peter says here that in these last days, scoffers will come. Now again, I think this is a reference to the false teachers, these scoffers of the false teachers here. But of course, this just characterizes the last days in general, right? I mean, ridiculers are going to come. Deniers of biblical truth are going to come along. And Peter says here, these scoffers will come, following after their own lusts, that's important, and saying, where's the promise of Jesus' coming? I mean, you don't really believe all this business about Jesus coming back, do you? Of course, their argument is this, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now, we asked the question earlier, why would these scoffers deny, ridicule the return of Christ? I mean, what's going on here? But what's going on here in our context is this. These mockers, who were only interested in chasing down the sinful desires of the flesh, and if they're the false teachers from chapter 2, that was made very clear. But it's even clear here in verse 3, right? Peter says, following after their own lust. Their, Their goal is to chase down the sinful desires of the flesh. Well, at some point, these folks, who seem to be associated with the congregation somehow, they were confronted with the biblical reality. Look, Jesus is coming back. And while this is a glorious day for believers as we go to be with Jesus, it also ushers in this coming day of the Lord judgment and destruction upon the ungodly. And During this tribulation period that follows. And these folks were headed for that judgment and destruction. Now, what are they going to do with that? When they're confronted with the reality that this judgment is coming at the return of Christ, what are they going to do with that? When a person is confronted with the reality that the wrath of God is coming upon the wickedness of of the world, they have to do something with that information. I mean, for example, you read verse 7. By God's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly men. I mean, what are you going to do with that? Deny it? Ignore it? Ridicule it? Distort it? Pretend like it doesn't say what it says? I mean, you're going to have to do something with it. Now, for some, God, totally of His sovereign grace and mercy, uses this as a catalyst moment of repentance. When people hear the wrath of God is coming... God uses it as a catalyst moment to bring them to repentance and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who is our righteousness and who rescues us from the wrath to come. In fact, beloved ones, if you are in Christ, you don't have to fear verse 7. But of course, a great many left to the hardness of their hearts will scoff at this judgment that's coming. And that's just what these folks were doing. They were ridiculing the return of Christ They they were denying and scoffing the return of Christ and the judgment it would bring upon them. You know, that's never going to happen. And they were mocking this biblical truth and reality, I think, on two fronts. First, by attacking the sources. Probably saying something along the lines of, well, who told you Jesus was coming back? and the coming judgment this ushers in upon the ungodly. I mean, where are you getting all this from? Well, the apostles told us. Oh, those guys. I mean, you know they're making that up, right? You know they're following cleverly devised tales, right? What did Peter say back in chapter 1 and verse 16? We didn't follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the prophets also proclaim this coming day of the Lord. No, I mean, ever since the fathers fell asleep, things will just keep on going along, right as they always have. I think the scoffers were attacking the sources, the apostles teaching the prophetic word, which is why Peter told them back in verse 2, I'm stirring you up, activating and engaging your mind to remember what was spoken and foretold by the prophets and taught by the apostles. 
right? Get in the Word and stay in the Word. That's your safeguard. But secondly, these scoffers were, I think, attacking the slowness, uh, the perceived delay in Jesus' return. I mean, you can almost just hear these scoffers say, you know, your apostles have been talking about this return of Jesus thing for years, don't you? I mean, they've been going about for decades now talking about the return of Christ and how it's near at hand and how it's imminent. Well, where is it? I mean, if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. And you know, those prophets proclaiming this coming day of the Lord judgment. Well, if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. What's well, taken so long? And by way of application, you know, people are tempted today to think along the same lines. You know, it's been 2,000 years since the promised return of Jesus. Well, where is it? Well, Peter's going to tell us how to understand this passage of time. Uh, there in verses 8 and 9, we'll get there. But at the core, these scoffers who are following after their own lusts, they don't want to deal with the reality of Jesus' return. And they don't want to deal with the reality of the coming judgment they would face on that day. So it's deny, it's ridicule, it's distort the word. And they are distorting the word here. Make no doubt about that. This phrase, their argument, ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it has from the beginning of creation. That's a distortion of the scriptures. Now, in what way is it, is it a distortion? I mean, maybe they were going back to the patriarchs, the fathers like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they were kind of leaving out Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 11 with creation and the flood and so on. Or maybe uh, they were going all the way back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, those fathers, and saying, look, well, ever since they died, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. You know, locating the beginning of creation there. This new start that God gave the world after the flood. God promised he'd never destroy all things again. There's a rainbow in the sky as a covenant to that promise that he'd never bring a worldwide judgment. So there's no day of the Lord judgment that's coming. The Lord said he wouldn't destroy all things. Oh, wait a minute. Read closely. He said he wouldn't destroy all things by water. He didn't say anything about fire. Well, whatever this father's fell asleep statement is getting at, it's clear they're deliberately distorting the word. They're leaving out essential parts of scripture. And by the way, just by way of some application here, we are headed down dangerous, destructive paths when we start leaving out parts of the scripture. You know, we just kind of pick and choose what we want and what we like. And, you know, this fits in with my theology, but that doesn't fit in with my theology. And this fits in with the way I want to live, but this doesn't fit in with the way I want to live. So we just start picking and choosing from the Bible what we want and what fits with what we like. No. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable. We don't get to pick and choose what we want and what we like and what we leave out and keep in. And Peter won't let him get away with it here. Verses 5 and 6. He says, when they maintain this argument, they've got their head in the sands. It escapes their notice that by God's word, the heavens, okay, so that's the sun, moon, sky, stars, and so on. The heavens, the expanse of the heavens, existed long ago. And the earth, out of water and through water, was formed by God's word. Now, this is straight up creation account right out of Genesis 1. You read it later today. This is right out of Genesis 1. But Peter's point here is to show that God, by his word, embedded into creation the means by which he would bring a worldwide judgment, namely the floodwaters. He built it right into creation, almost like he knew what he was going to do. In fact, he did. Uh, the, the earth and the waters and the expanse and the canopy of waters that surrounded that, they were all created by God's word. They were kept in place by God's word until, verse 6, by these things, by God's word and by the water he embedded into creation, the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water. Now here's the connection. Verse 7, Peter says, 
the same thing is coming. Things are not going to go on always like they have. It didn't in the days of Noah, and it won't in these last days. Verse 7, by God's word, the present heavens, the expanse of the heavens, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Things are not going to continue as they always have. God has embedded into creation itself the means by which he will bring worldwide judgment during the tribulation period, this time not by water, this time by fire. And you might say, well, how, how could that ever happen? People in Noah's day may have been thinking the same thing. A flood? A worldwide flood judgment? Yeah, how's that ever going to happen? Judgment by fire? How's that going to happen? Revelation 8. We get this series of trumpet judgments sounded forth during this tribulation period. Here's the first one. The first trumpet sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. They were thrown to the earth. Right? This isn't happening by chance. They were thrown to the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees burned up. All the green grass burned up. Revelation 16 and verse 8, there are these bowl judgments poured out. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Things are not going to continue on as they always have, Peter's saying here. Now here's the good news. All who are in Christ, all who are in Christ will never suffer this wrath of God. First, because Christ took this wrath of God against our sin upon himself. And there he died in our place so that we would have peace with God. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God. We're reconciled to God. We never face the judgment wrath of God. Jesus took it for us. <laughs> Praise God he did. Secondly, when Christ returns, we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. So we will be rescued from this day of the Lord judgment. But in the big picture, these scoffers deny the return of Jesus. Why? Why? Because they are really wanting to deny this coming judgment that it ushers in. And Peter says, no, things aren't going to continue like they always have. Well, that brings us to verses 8 and 9. And we'll draw to a close with this. So there's this issue of perceived delay. Somebody might say, well, James, it's been over 2,000 years since Christ made this promise to return again and, and all that ushers in. It's been over 2,000 years now. You go back to the prophets proclaiming this uh, great and terrible day of the Lord. He goes back even further. What's well, taken so long? Peter says, the promise of Christ's return and all that it ushers in is not delayed. In fact, it's the Lord's patience that's being displayed. That's how we understand this passage of time. It's not a delay. It's God's patience. God's not asleep at the wheel. God has not abandoned his redemptive work. God has not forgotten his word. It's the Lord's patience. Verse 8, Peter says, Do not let this one fact escape your notice. It, it may have escaped their notice. Don't let this one fact escape your notice, beloved ones. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and one thousand years is like a day. Now, we don't build a whole theology of God and time on this one statement. Basically, Peter's saying here, uh, we can't judge God's actions as fast or slow uh, by our own experience of the passing of time. We can't judge God's actions as fast or slow by our own experience of the passing of time. I mean, for us, it feels like forever when we text someone and it takes them two minutes to respond back. We're like, man, this is taking forever. What's well, taking them so long? 
We can't judge God by our experience of the, of the passing of time. The Lord is eternal without beginning or end. He's not constrained by time. In fact, he's created time. So verse 9, building on that, Peter says this. The Lord is not slow about his promise. Okay, what's the promise? The promise of Christ's return, but also that all that that ushers in. Uh, the, the glorious day that is for believers, but also the tribulation judgment that ushers in upon the world. The Lord's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. There's no delay here. The Lord is patient toward you. Not wishing for any. The any here is tied back into the you. Not wishing for any of you to perish, but all, all of you to come to repentance. Now, this isn't universalism here. This is Peter cluing them in that there are folks, even in the congregation, that the Lord is saving. That the Lord is bringing under repentance and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, we know from Romans 11 and verse 25. There is the fullness of Gentiles that the Lord is bringing in to the fold, that the Lord is saving. Now, how many is that number? Um, how long will it take? Only the Lord knows. But each day that passes and Jesus doesn't return, it's not a delay. It's only a display of the Lord's patience as he brings in the fullness of all who are his under repentance. And so we go to bed tonight, you know, we lay our heads down on the pillow and Jesus hasn't returned yet. How do we think about this? Well, here's how we think about it. The Lord's patient. Here's how we think about it. We rejoice because what a display of God's glorious character, his patience, as he is bringing all who are his under repentance and he will not lose one. And so there's no delay just a display of God's great and glorious character, namely his patience. Now, we're going to have to hit the pause button. We will pick back up there next week. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, how we give you praise today for the great and precious promises we have in your word and, and the promise we have of Christ's imminent return and how we look forward to that day. What a glorious day. It will be. And Father, I pray today, uh, as we live out this week, we would live keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do ask this all in his name. Amen.